Sweden did play this role of the contrarian. It was a very inconvenient counterexample to all these other countries in the world that had locked down. And this was the kind of coverage that you would see. The New York Times in uh, July 2020, Sweden has become the world's cautionary tale. You had uh, them saying that Sweden put stock in the sensibility of its people. And for that grave sin, the coronavirus is blamed for 5,420 deaths, which is 40% more than the U U.S. per million people, 12 times more than Norway, seven times more than Finland, six times more than Denmark. We heard a lot of these comparisons to Sweden's Nordic neighbors in particular. Donald Trump was out there tweeting, Sweden is paying heavily for its decision not to lock down. The United States made the correct decision. We've got a clip from Trump that I'm, we're going to play here where he's making essentially the same point. Let's roll that. Uh, now, they talk about Sweden, but Sweden is suffering very gravely. You know that, right? Sweden did that. The herd, they call it the herd. Uh, Sweden suffering very, very badly. Uh, it's a way of doing it, but uh, the, it, it, you know, everybody has been watching everybody else. And so far, almost every country has done it the way we've done it. We've chosen to do it. If we didn't do it that way, we would have lost hundreds of thousands of more people. Okay. And then I want to get your reaction in a second, Johan, but First, just back to back with that clip, I want to play a clip of what you were saying in that same period. That was from April 7th, 2020. This was from about a week later, uh, what you were saying about the experience in Sweden and what, how people should think about it. Let's roll the clip of Johan from April 2020. My personal point of view, I'm not an epidemiologist. I can't even pronounce the word. Um, it seems like uh, I'm, I'm obviously not an expert when it comes to these issues. But so far, I'm broadly sympathetic to the Swedish model. Uh, restricting freedoms might be necessary during pandemics, but only when we have good reasons to assume that this will help us when it comes to our long-term health. And when we don't know, I think stick to what we do know. As John Stewart once put it, in every instance, the burden of making out a strong case lies not on those who resist, but on those who recommend government interference. So mm. that was a very humble and cautious defense of Sweden's approach. What was it like for, for you during that time period, uh, you know, cautiously defending Sweden amidst this firestorm of criticism of the country's approach. Yeah, we weren't popular at that time. And both the friend, foreign friends and foreign media got in touch and asked me, are you all crazy? Have you gone crazy over there? Because <laughs> there's a pandemic and you seems like you haven't noticed. So I had to explain not myself, but I had to explain the Swedish model again and again. And I think precisely for this reason, exactly what Donald Trump talked about here, that everybody did it. Everybody except Sweden mm -hmm. locked down societies entirely. And then in that case, first of all, why did they do it? And it seemed like Trump didn't have much more of a suggestion than everybody did it. So we did. And that's actually exactly what researchers say when they look into this. The moment when societies locked down was not related in any way. It was impossible for researchers to find any kind of correlation with the state of transmission of the virus, uh, geographical location, number of uh, capacity of the healthcare system, and things like that. The one thing it correlated with was what did the neighbors do? What did countries close by you? did. So it seems like it was a bandwagon effect. Rather than looking into the data, the research, and doing a cost-benefit analysis, people just did it. Because obviously it is, if you do a mis if you make a mistake and the country suffers, it's okay. If everybody did the same mistake, then you can say we had no alternative. We just had to lock down, for example. But if you're the odd man out and you make a decision and your people suffer, then everybody will blame you. And so 
countries just panicked into this kind of lockdown policy. And, and Sweden was the one place where that didn't happen. It was, I mean, in a sense, that was a huge risk, right? I, that it requires a certain, um, I think, courage on the part of Swedish pandemic authorities. I think it did, especially because, um, you know, they would be the ones to blame if yeah. things uh, went wrong. And um, but what they were saying all the time is that it isn't us who've taken this risk. We're the one place that actually didn't enter into an unprecedented panic position uh, of, of locking down entire societies, economies, schools like that. Well, health authorities had war gamed pandemics before the World Health Organization and, and others. And no one has suggested that we should lock down entire societies. But then suddenly when this happened and China started to lock down and then Italy, everybody just got on board. The and thing that I think is also so interesting about this, excuse my interruption, but the thing that I think is so interesting about this is also that like China had an especially uh, it just astonishingly intense lockdown, um, you know, neighborhood level enforcers going door to door and, you know, these mandatory quarantines that made it so in many cases you had families trapped in their apartments, sort of, you know, legitimately unable to even, in some cases, go outside for a walk, depending on when the virus was surging in different neighborhoods and regions. Um, but the thing that's kind of interesting is like, not all lockdowns are structured the same. And like China's was considered too um, authoritarian and full throated, and I guess difficult to enforce for that to be implemented in other countries. But it's odd, because Sweden got I think, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, a different treatment as an outlier, even though China, too, was an outlier in its se like severity. Um, that's kind of stunning to me that the onus is on the um, people emphasizing freedom, freedom of movement, uh, people's ability to continue to go to the weddings and funerals of their loved ones. It's fascinating to me that the authoritarianism didn't require as much justification, but the freedom did. Yeah, yeah and let me just jump sure. in there because... Because, you know, uh, it was the, the justification that was being used to criticize Sweden so harshly was always it wasn't that it was the, the death rate was way out of whack with every other country that was doing lockdowns. It was specifically, well, if you compare it only to the Nordic, its Nordic neighbors, if you compare it only to uh, Finland and Norway and Denmark, it looks bad at this point this snapshot in time. Um, you know, if you were comparing it to the United Kingdom or Italy at that time, it's, it's not going to look, it, it's not going to look as, as bad. Um, and so that, that implies that there's other factors at play perhaps than just whether you're locking down or not. But, uh, we, we have a clip of, uh, Sweden's state epi epidemiologist Anders Teniel responding to exactly that point um, uh, th that was uh, put to him by the uh, BBC interviewer on, on a very tough and, and good interview uh, back in 2020. So let's roll uh, a segment from that interview. And I'd like you to respond to what Tenniel is saying It's not here. the brutal truth that you have had many more deaths in Sweden than you would have had if, like your Scandinavian neighbours, you had imposed an early and very strict lockdown policy? I think that's very difficult to, to know. Uh, I mean, the death toll in Sweden is mainly in the long-term uh, facilities for long-term ill elderly people. Uh, and we had very much an unfortunate spread in those facilities in a way that, that some other countries had, but not our Nordic neighbors. And, and why we had a spread in Sweden and not in our na other neighboring countries. Uh, that's something we're trying to investigate now. But, 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 but with respect, uh, Dr. Teniel, isn't that part of my point that you probably would not have had that catastrophic spread of COVID-19 through your care home, homes, particularly around Stockholm, if you had run a more strict, a less open policy for the general population? Yeah, I mean, these people meet a lot of people, even if you have a lockdown, so you can't isolate them. So in that way, a lockdown would not have um, stopped the spread into them. And we can see now when we are starting to look at these places, uh, 
we see a decline in the incidence in those places once we start really focusing and getting them to focus on basic hygiene procedures and so on. So Teniel defended himself by saying that it was too early to say whether lockdown saved lives or just delayed inevitable deaths. How does that look in retrospect? Yeah, there are many factors here. And uh, let me just mention uh, one important difference here between Sweden and other Nordic countries. We got the virus earlier at an earlier stage, mm -hmm. partly because Stockholm uh, kids are home on a winter break in early February. And many go to the Italian and Austrian Alps to ski uh, exactly at the moment when the we had the peak of transmission in in Italy. So it was already within our uh, societies, especially in Stockholm and then the elderly care homes before there was any discussion anywhere about uh, locking down societies. So this and goes to the so tradition. We saw, we saw more of a coronavirus surge in Stockholm than in you know Malmo, for example, because of the timing of school breaks. Exactly. And that's a very okay. important point. You could see that Malmö and Gothenburg, our second and third city in, in Sweden, had more of the Norwegian and Danish experience mm -hmm. because they didn't go on a winter break down to Italy at that time because the winter break comes, it's staggered. So it comes at different moments in time. And this mm -hmm. goes to one important traditional point from epidemiology, the reason why they re rarely recommend countries to shut down borders and, and traffic and so on, is that the moment you begin to think about doing things like that, it's already too late because it <laughs> happens once the virus is already there. And then you only hurt yourself in other ways, hurting access to everything from health workers, medical supplies and trade and the economy and so on. Not to mention but, the human toll. Also, I don't know what your family situation is, but my family, like my family split between the United States and the EU. And so to some degree, when you begin to close off borders, it puts a lot of people in very difficult situations where depending on their visa status and their passport, they might not see their family members or their loved ones or their partner for many, many months uh, on end, which is a huge human toll that I think frequently our policymakers, I, there's no way to attach a monetary value to that, yeah. but it is a profound sense of loss. This is such an incredibly important point because that's exactly the kind of perspective that would never appear to uh, the technocrats at the decision table. Sort of, we, we've got to have to do something about X. But then there are so many variables that are incredibly important to human beings that cannot be quantified to that extent and that they cannot have knowledge about. Not meeting your loved ones, not meeting friends and family and so on could be almost as dangerous to health as uh, as getting the virus. So, uh, And that's a reason why a, a policy based on recommendations gives you that sort of incredibly important loophole. You're able mm -hmm. to do things that are so important to you. So when you look at the, the total death toll and the uh, aspects of health, you have to look at other things as well, not just COVID, but also mental illness. You're going to have to look at domestic abuse. You have to look at suicide or ex loss of exercise and, and social adaptation in schools, in uh, friendship circles and, and so on. Hey, thanks for watching that clip from our conversation with Johan Norberg about Sweden's pandemic policies. You can watch the full conversation right here or another clip from that conversation right over here.